Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you have played against chess bots in your lifetime? They're all kind of strange, mysterious, obnoxious. We develop these weird kind of rivalries with them, even though they don't even know who we are or that we exist. Well, in the year 1985, Garry Kasparov, who was on his way to becoming the world champion later that year, was invited to play 32 chess machines at the same time in a simul. He walked around the room and he just played against these things that looked like TI calculators or panini fryers and he won every single game. And in this video, I'm gonna take you through six of some of the most impressive games against the different engines. And in the last game that he played, he actually was in some trouble. So we're gonna take a look at that game as well. Here we go. First game I'd like to show you is against Mephisto. Uh, and um, the game begins with Gary going for a Catalan. Now it's interesting to note that even 36 years ago, the Catalan was a very useful kind of repertoire with the bishop coming to g2 in queen's gambits versus knight f6, e6, and d5 setups. Uh, let's keep in mind a couple of things in the year 1985. So uh, computers are more materialistic. They don't really have opening books. So um, it, it's a lot harder for them to be programmed with what they know is the best move. Like a lot of them are actually thinking from the very beginning. Um, and Kasparov talks about all these engines more in his, um, like his TED talk, for example, that he did on machines. So Mephisto plays the move uh, c5. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a kind of a counter clash in the center. The major imbalance here is this light squared bishop on g2. We have a trade on d5, and now the engine doesn't take on d5, it takes on d4. Uh, and Kasparov keeps on going. So, now the question is, you know, can black take on e6 with the bishop? Giving up this pawn, and maybe even this rook, with the intention to get something like this, like white loses the light squared uh, cover here, and um, white is better, materially speaking, so the engine would never go for this, but black does have some active play. Uh, the computer instead opts to take like this. Kasparov quickly finishes his development, bishop to c5, and e5. Now, um, at this point, uh, white has a couple of ways forward, but because white is more developed, and black is kind of overextended in the center of the board here with these two pawns, there's a lot more tactical opportunities for white. Uh, the knight can go to c4. This knight is, is always kind of lurking here, pressuring this pawn. The bishop opens up at any moment. The king is actually surprisingly unsafe. How do you take advantage of this king? By playing this move. That's a nice move. That is a move that for an engine in 1985, you do not see. And of course, Gary Kasparov plays this move. Very common. Why? If the knight takes, you take on e5. Not complicated. Right? And then you open up your bishop and you're much better. But if the bishop takes... Uh, you actually still take on e5. And that's how you get to this king, because now you can jump out here with this queen check. It's a very common idea. All these ideas flow together in these neo-Catalan or Catalan-style positions. You will then get the bishop. You can take and then get the bishop, uh, and uh, you are much better. So after b4, uh, the computer in the game decides to do this and play queen e7 and just slide the king out of danger. The problem is that Gary is now much, much better. Even though material is completely equal, because Black's king is congested, uh, this rook is not going to get out into the game. Uh, and this pawn is always a weakness. So king safety, poor development, and a weakness in the middle of the board. One guy is much better. Gary, Ga Gary now has to deal with b5. This is the engine's way of get getting some counterplay. Queen b5, bishop a6, right? Sacrificing a pawn for some activity, but Gary says no. I'm not going to let you get any play. And then he plays bishop a3, point of which he's got sort of pressure coming on the queen side at any moment. The whole position's about to fall apart. a5, rook c1. And throughout this match, you're going to see Gary do uh, certain liquidations, certain simplifications in positions where he is traditionally completely winning. So he takes on c5. Rook takes c5. Uh, knight takes c5. And queen takes d4, giving up a rook for a bishop and a pawn, but nagging permanent pressure on the position. And again, keep in mind that the, the, this, this machine is playing without this rook on h8, right? So it's not like you've really even invested a whole lot. The machine plays king to g8, rook c1, knight e6, and now Gary takes the knight on b4. Just again, removing another active piece from the board uh, and plays bishop h3. Continuous pressure. Gary is playing this game with five pieces. It doesn't matter that one of them is not a rook because he sacrificed it. Black is playing this game with four pieces. Okay, and the problem is that uh, one of our kings is significantly safer than the other. If somehow this rook could kangaroo over to f8, then actually black is very happy, but it can't. So, yeah, I mean, even if it's an engine. Bishop d5, now we see Kasparov infiltrate. 
Um, and yeah, the machine is reduced here to just utter, uh, uh, an utterly depressing position. Now Gary takes the rook, and then Gary takes the bishop. So again, we are reduced to two versus three. But again, it's because the king is horribly weak. Queen b4. And I mean, just look at this. I mean, what is Gary doing to this poor machine? And all, I mean, his king is completely safe. His king always can go to g2 where that bishop stood. And he's just playing with more material. Black is just simply unable to do anything. And the rest of this game is basically Gary effortlessly improving his position. He takes that final pawn. Material balance is restored now. It's knight and two pawns for a rook. And the second the engine just basically tries to get out, he snags the pawn on g6. And um, computers play until mate, essentially. So the engine could have resigned at any moment, but uh, it decided to resign on move 43 when it's very clear that this is going to just, I mean, this is simply an unsavable position. And even though the rook actually got to move, if we just go all the way like back here, for example, look what Gary did to this poor machine. It took this machine, how many moves to move the rook? 37 moves to finally make one rook move only to be reduced all the way back to the corner. And uh, yeah, Gary won a very, very nice game. Um, next game. Yeah, let's do it. Next game. This one is against Superstar 36K. I don't know. It's just, I don't, I don't know what these names are. It sounds like a rapper in 2021. Uh, this one was a Karo Khan. Kind of interesting. Uh, interesting. A lot of these openings were, uh, I tried to pick six different openings, six different types of positions. Uh, and we have DE4, Knight E4, Knight F6. This is actually an incredibly popular variation of the Karo Khan to this day. I play this with the black pieces. This is known as the Tarta cover. And the best way to play here is C3, Bishop D3, Queen C2, Knight D2 nowadays. And Gary Kasparov knows that in the year 1985. He plays all those moves. Um, nowadays, believe it or not, this, uh, th the whole point here is to give this check and then play h5. Nowadays, this is actually the main line, to play h5, h4, stop the movement of this. But white is always comfortably better, right? So h6 is played, queen c7, and we have like all the makings of a traditional Tartic Hour variation. Uh, and trades occur on the f4 square, either via bishop or knight, and if you just remove, let's say, this side of the board over here, you're left with a four on three situation. Many end games are going to be advantageous for the side that simply has the extra pawn because this side is sort of a three on three. Even though it's four, these pawns are doubled. So black can struggle in end games here, right? Knight f4, knight b6, and Gary just actually goes for the bishop pair trade. So he decides to do it like this. Black is left with a little bit of a weakness, but a strong knight on d5 and uh, reroutes the pieces and seems to be going for some sort of thing over here on h2. Can't really say I fault the computer for going to, for checkmate. But c4. And now here's the thing. If you take my bishop on e3, it becomes very clear you're just not equipped to defend this pawn. Because if you play rook e8, I play bishop g6. And um, yeah, I mean, when you put three pawns on dark squares, all the light squares are going to be weak. So Gary forces the knight out to b4 and says, no, 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 you actually can't have that bishop. Now, where's your knight going? Now the computer has two problems, the knight and the pawn, right? So rook d8, so now we, we force the knight to move, and now we slide the queen in front of our own bishop. And uh, it becomes very difficult to protect this. You only have one way to do it. It's probably gotta be f5. Um, I mean, th this counts as a way, I guess, because no mate, but that's just such a weakening move. No, f5. All right, white to play and put some very serious pressure on the black position. I'll give you a hint. The hint is breakthrough. When you think breakthrough, what do you think? It's not picking up a chess clock and ba bashing your opponent over their head. That's not a breakthrough. No. Breakthrough means d5. All right. And keep in mind, Kasparov has to make every move virtually instantly. That's the way a simul works. You walk around, your opponent makes a move when you get there, you respond. Maybe you think five to ten seconds, right? Um, so Gary just plays this move on instinct. Takes, 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 takes. Rook d1. So he's down a pawn. He's actually just cleanly down a pawn, but because he has a ton of pressure and this knight is still completely out of the game, um, Kasparov is just much better. He's got pressure on three spots, uh, not to mention, obviously, you know, the bishop here and it's difficult to move. Um, Queen e5, of course, Kasparov doesn't get mated, does not trade pieces, and then plays bishop a2. And now it's very clear he's going to get his, you know, his pawn back. 
but the machine is defending. The machine's it, uh, the thing about the machine is that it's a tenacious defender. It never feels emotion. It's not like, oh man, why did I show up to play this simul? Darn it, I'm in a terrible position. It doesn't think like that. It's just like, I have to find the best move, what I think is the best move. So Kasparov gets his pawn back. Symmetrical structure, 2-3, two, 2-3 three, two, three on each side, but white is more active. So what are we going to do now? Queen e2, and let's trade rooks. So now Gary has to outplay an engine from a better endgame. How does he do that? Well, at this point, engines are not bulletproof calculators in late stage games. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility and endgames are really a finesse. So Gary reroutes his bishop to c3. Although the machine actually here by this point has gotten some pretty decent activity, but it's very bad at playing like stagnant moves. It's not very good at just kind of keeping the balance and Finding your opponent's resources and ideas is still a little bit of a struggle, and Gary immediately pounces. White to play. Queen to d3. Half of the idea is taking the knight and taking this pawn with check. Like, bishop d4, queen d4, queen f5. Of course, black can play bishop d4, so, you know, the other idea, not just that idea, is this. And now you're going over here. Now, the engine's not going to blunder a mate, but what it will blunder is a position. The engine has stopped the threat, but it hasn't realized it has, it has no moves. Like, it stopped what it thought was necessary, but now Kasparov absolutely paralyzes it, and watch, he just keeps pushing pawns. The computer can't move. It got itself into a total state of paralysis. It can't move the queen, the knight, or the bishop. So now Gary just, look, see, suffocating, suffocating. Every piece slowly, now, now the engine's getting desperate, so it sacrifices its f-pawn to create a little bit of activity and tactical complication and it just blunders immediately. It blunders the fact that it, its king is actually not safe here at all. It thinks it's safe. It, it thinks that it can always cover. It can't because check, bishop d5, Gary repeats once, and now queen e7, queen f8, and um, just this, just this. So bishop a8. Now, if we go back, we can probably find a way that Kasparov could have won this like with mate, like he probably could have played f5 here. Um, but you need to actually calculate this move. Um, but the idea is that, you know, obviously if, if pawn takes f5, bishop f5, and you actually swarm, you have a checkmate net here, which is hard to see in a simul. Um, but the other idea is that you have this really disgusting box. You can box in the queen, and f5, f6 would have been brutal. But Kasparov takes the zero-risk approach, trades off the queen, wins both pawns, and the computer resigned because you're, you're, just, you're just not stopping these pawns. Um, this, this, this endgame is also losing. Uh, something like this. Like, the, the bishop now needs to stay protecting this, and the king just walks. So, very easy win for white. Nice game by Kasparov, although he doesn't really need my praise. Uh, third game I'd like to show you is a game played against Constellation. Uh, this one begins with an English. Uh, very uh, traditional English. G3, knight c3, you know, gonna be maneuvering game. Um, but black plays bishop e6, queen d7. The point of this is that, obviously, when this knight moves, you want to play bishop h3. I mean, it's the, it's, it's the whole point of the opening, that bishop on g2, you want to get rid of it. So, Gary here um, probably shocks uh, the enemy side, and he plays the move b4. Now, we've seen b4. We saw b4 with another bishop on g2 two games ago, and the tactical patterns overlap. But in this case, there is no check on a4, because the queen just takes you. Um, but Kasparov wants to get a position that looks kind of like this. This is what Gary's after, I think. He, he, he wants the opening of the B-file. He wants kind of a tactical shootout. Um, yeah, I, I, I would imagine that after, you know, night, night, night before, he would have probably gone for some counterplay on the queen side. But the engine doesn't even want to give up B7, so it plays A6. And now we have all the makings of a turbo English. Because in the turbo English, you have a bishop on G2, and you play rook B1, A4, B5, and you just attack the queen side. Because that's kind of where your pieces are facing, right? So he plays e3, knight e2, so as not to block this bishop. Uh, at some point, bishop h3 would have been possible, but not anymore because c7. If you're confused, the queen cannot guard both spots. I mean, the queen cannot guard h3 and c7, right? So castles, and now Gary plays h3 himself. So that bishop cannot come. But how is Gary going to get away with this? Because if he plays h3, he's not going to castle. Yeah, he has, no, he has no intention of castling. Gary's going to leave his king in the middle. Very interesting. So the common idea of black playing bishop to h3 is now no longer possible, even though the engine set it up. You see? The engine defended c7. No, a4. 
And now Gary's just not going to castle. G4! Kick the bishop out, B5. So he locks the center, but he keeps playing on both sides of the board. He's gaining space on both sides of the board, right? A, B, A, B, knight goes out to A5. And now, a really interesting move, E4. A move that blocks the light scored bishop, but black has very limited movement now. This bishop can't move. This bishop can't move. This knight can't move. This knight can't move. Black is going to have to go back to go forward, or black is going to have to trade some pieces. So, C6. Take on F6. Bishop of six, and now h4. Uh-oh. Gary's coming in. Like, the most unseen of attacks, right? I mean, what? How are you just going to attack with those G and H pawns? Well, they have enough support. Believe it or not, they're backed up. They actually have enough support. Now the engine's like, oh, crap. Oh, crap. Now, if you try to create a fortress here, this looks like the smartest thing to do. The problem is it's not, because your queen gets hit. Let's say you move back. Kasparov will probably play a mix of a couple moves here, but f4 is coming. So for example, like let's say cb, I don't know, you try to create a little counterplay, rook b5, knight c6. I mean b7 is falling in a lot of lines, right? So you, the whole game is going to get decided by your weaknesses, but let's say you close the position. Well, then f4 is going to come at some point. And uh, if takes, I mean knight d5, bishop on b2, or even on f4... Good luck ever rescuing this knight from the edge of the board. I mean, you sent it to the North Pole and left everybody behind. South Pole, where those bases are. I mean, so CB5, and uh, the engine goes for F5. It's like, woo, let's go for some counterplay. Kasparov plays bishop H3, maintaining that pressure. All the while, his king in the middle of the board. Queen on C5, now he takes on F5. And the floodgates open up here. He has a couple of moves that look good. Knight E4 looks beautiful. F6, G8, G6. G6 actually doesn't look as beautiful, because why are you blocking your attack? No, because Barov plays F6. A forceful way of shredding it all open. Bam, bam. You cannot take because of this fork. So now there's an open king. The knight transfer, the queen, the rook, and the bishop can all come to a 5 because Barov is about to attack with all five pieces against the king that virtually has no defense. So how does he do it? Let's jump in with the knight. Kick the queen away. Rook G1 check. And here comes the queen. Now, it looks like there's no threat because you can't go to g7 or g8. There is a threat. It's actually a really disgusting threat. The threat is, in this position, queen g7. That's the threat. Takes, and it doesn't matter where the king moves because knight f6 is mate. How disgusting is that? My man is threatening a queen sack mate against one of the leading engines of the world in 1985. Unfortunately, the computer does find a way out of it by covering the f6 square. Um, queen f5, and uh, Gary still shoves something in the computer's face with rook g7. Take, take, and uh, now he's got four attacking pieces. Queen f6 check. Here, here, and uh, that's mate. So the computer plays two more moves, and uh, Gary checkmates it on g7. Absolutely insane game, this one. Fantastic game. Like, fascinating. So he clamps the center, and he just advances effortlessly on both sides of the board, like it's nothing paralyzing his opponent's movement and out of nowhere h4 like i thought this was here to restrict the pieces no no gary says i have this cast on i'm still gonna you know what i mean oh my gosh it's uh yeah yeah it's like when george st pierre was sitting in his corner and said i think i pulled my groin and his coach says i want you to hit him with your groin or something like that i mean just h4 like h4 <laughs> just <laughs> it looks like that's your weak spot. Nope. My man just absolutely tears through Constellation. All right. Game number four against the, 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 the... I mean, they really couldn't have named this engine anything better. Elite AS Experimental. Just name it Elite. Like, geez. Anyway, this one's a Sicilian defense. Alapin, C3. Knight F6. And this variation with CD4, Knight F3. Not really a gambit. I mean, just kind of a delaying move. You can't take because you lose your knight. Um, knight c6, and Kasparov goes for this variation where you actually, um, you actually target the knight and, and, and you do allow black to take. And Kasparov is a savage because the main line in this position is for black to play d5 or d6. Okay, it's to move the d-pawn. It is not to take and enter the Smith-Mora. You see, Kasparov could have played d4 and c3, the Smith-Mora gambit, which I don't know the popularity of it in 1985. Um, I would imagine it's, it wasn't super high. Um, but, uh, Kasparov got his, uh, digital rival to actually go 
Why is this stupid human giving me a second pawn? What an idiot. E6. Now I'm going to just develop the rest of my pieces with D5 and, you know, get, get castled. Now, here, modern day computer gives castles for white. D5 for black because you got to get a little space. Takes, takes, and it, believe it or not, Stockfish still thinks white is better. Even if you allow your opponent to get a little bit of development, it actually likes white's position. Queen E2, Rook D1, it really loves the open lines. It likes the open spirit. The, the, the fluidity of the, uh, of the Smith Mora. Um, but, uh, but Gary knew what he was doing. And Gary played knight e4. And the point of knight e4 is that you want to just shove this knight right into d6 because you know it's going to be difficult to move this bishop and the computer is not going to be able to handle it the right way. Or so Gary hypothesizes. Let's see what the computer can come up with. f6. Check. Here. Here. Now both sides castle. Okay. The engine needs to get moving or else it's going to fall behind, right? It needs to play b6, bishop, b7. For example, let's hypothetically get to a position like, um, like just say this move is possible and bishop d5 is not possible, and then f5, and then knight f6, and then b6, and then bishop b7. Actually, black is very happy here. However, we made five moves in a row for black. Probably not possible at this level, right? So the machine plays a5 to try to get queen side space. Gary's like, yeah, come, come and get some. Now... You still have nowhere to move this knight because this bishop completely dominates it. So the machine here plays a fascinating move. Rook a5. What? Rook a5. Okay, rook a5. Uh-huh. Bishop e3, knight e5. Now Gary's like, all right, well, you got the knights moving, but it's going to take you a little time to move your bishop. So how are you going to deal with this rook threat? How are you going to deal with this rook? Gary's like, come and get, let's go. It's like a mouse and cheese in the trap. Rook b2? That's great. You're up two pawns. Congrats. But uh, what about these pieces? Now Gary's like, <laughs> shuts the trap. Bishop takes d5. Bishop to c3, forcing the rook to a2. Why? Well, rook b6, bishop a5. But maybe not even bishop a5. Maybe bishop a5 is good. You might even go here. Because you just don't want him to take this pawn. Like, bishop a5 is fine, but... Knight e7 is coming. Queen h5 is coming. Bishop e5 and queen g4 is coming. Black just has no moves at all. So the rook goes over here. Now Gary gets one pawn back. Um, and right here, the computer realizes something's gone horribly wrong. Because it's like move 22, and you got two pieces wandering around the board, and the other four are left behind. So the computer goes rook f2. Look at this. Rook f2, knight c1. It trades its rook for another pawn, just one more pawn, before trapping its own knight. And, yeah, I mean, the rest of this game is a little depressing. It's like watching a mouse flail around in a mousetrap. Um, yeah, the computer has to end up sacrificing. And uh, the bishop that never moved gets captured on move 34, and the, and the computer resigns. The bishop never moved. Gary Kasparov found a way to get the, the, these machines to just not move pieces. It's pretty fascinating. Like, I, it just makes it look so simple, right? Uh, but that's not even the most brilliant. Um, we're going to look at this game, and then the final game of this video is, uh, is Kasparov um, actually getting in a little bit of trouble, okay? Um, this one, a Torre attack. So we have d4, uh, the first d4 of the video, because we see a lot of c4, we saw a lot of e4. Uh, the Torre attack with, with bishop g5 and knight d2, and um, yeah, a very solid structure. It looks like a London, except the bishop kind of went one extra square. Um, and we didn't really have uh we, we didn't have a trade until move 10 and quite an interesting trade bishop c6 so kasparov has a ton of pawns on dark squares right six out of eight but he trades his light squared bishop how does that make sense that's not normal you're supposed to put a bunch of pawns on light squares if you trade your light square bishop no if you're gary kasparov you can actually kind of reinvent your rules um here's the thing that pawn on c6 is really weak and Kasparov targets it, the queen, which is trying to defend everything. Now, machine here plays knight h5 because anywhere you move this knight, like, you know, the bishop is going to get taken unless you create a double threat. So now the queen is hanging in two side, like on two ways, right? Queen's got to move. It goes to e6. Kasparov plays knight back to e5. And we have this, rook b8. Now, on the one hand, you could have also taken on g3. Here, 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 to this position. Uh, that ends up happening. The computer decides to attack b2 first. And we have a huge transformation, right? Something like this. 
Who is better here and why? There is one answer to this question. The answer to this question is why it is better because of the pawn structure. These two pawns are a little bit soft, split here between E and G, doubled pawns, and isolated pawn. White's got a really good pawn structure, and that light squared bishop can't really target anything. What's the best move here for White? Kasparov thinks it's to trade queens. Now, if queen d4, trivia, what do you take with? There is only one answer, I would say. What do you take with? Let's see how good you are. What would you take with here? You gotta take with the e pawn. Because you open your e file, you permanently make c5 impossible. And once you put a rook on e2 and guard this, you play knight c5, your knight lives on c5 forever. Forever. In the words of Adam Sterling, for life. Did I say Adam Sterling? Adam Silver. In regards to the Donald Sterling incident. Queen d6. c4. e5. Queen c3. King h7. And now all the tension of this game is going to be decided right here in the middle of the board. How is Kasparov going to break through against this computer? Well, <coughs> you notice all his pieces are on dark squares. Light squared bishop can't do anything. Knight is standing on a light square, but a light squared knight only fights for dark squares as well. The center is about to be broken through because this is not a sustainable structure. And Kasparov chops and plays a nice little queen trade. Again, a queen trade. This one a bit more forcing because it also attacks a rook. And the pawns are going to fall apart. Bishop e6. Now Gary, look at this. F4. Nice move. Because you target the weak pawn in the center. Anywhere it moves, something is going to come to d4, right? And, and there it is. And rook c2. And from a position that seemingly was a little bit on the verge of equality, Gary just suffocates the computer, enjoying himself, walks his king over, comes back, and he's like, all right, now I'm going to break through on that side of the board, and I'm going to win this pawn. <laughs> I'm not going to win any pawn. I'm not going to win any pawn just yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to checkmate you somehow. And um, the machine resigned here. The machine resigned with that. Like, like, Gary basically pulled up, showed the machine that he had, like, three bazookas, Two attack helicopters, a tank. It was like, all right, I'm not even going to fire anything. You could just resign right now. And the computer was like, yep, I'm good. I'm good. I, you proved to me you're superior. I'm fine. We both have material equality, but my pieces are not the same as yours. I can't move anything. You win. All right, final game. This one against Turbo Star. Okay, this one, another English. Knight f6, and actually a very legitimate variation, the Neo-Catalan accepted. Nowadays, the main line here, queen a4, um, played so much at top level. Uh, but back then, Gary decided to do it like this. Kind of leave that c4 pawn in limbo. Because there's a chance that the machine will just simply go for defending it. Um, and now this move also kind of doesn't allow b5 to happen. This should be 7 queen c2. And the machine just lets Gary win the pawn back and puts the knight on d5. This is a very obscure and probably pretty bad setup because it just allows a5. I mean, you're really not supposed to allow a5. Um, <clears throat> a6, I mean, e even just standing here and not allowing anything to, yeah, but whatever. It's 1985, no one knows anything. Knight b4, and uh, finally the machine itself plays a5. I was actually kind of surprised Gary didn't do it, but it's a simul, <clears throat> you know, Gary just wants to kind of play simple, focus on the center of the board, and he does have a good position. Uh, bishop d7, and uh, it's quite clear already the machines are really bad at playing these positions with no space, right? I mean, Gary's got a really nice situation here. Bishop e3. Machine does some obscure, like, it, it, it's, it's trying to reroute its bishop to a point of usefulness. Uh, and it, it actually is, isn't, like, doing a terrible thing, but this is very weak. Um, Gary plays h3 with the intention to play g4. And now the machine shows its point. It plays f5. That's a good move. Um, that's a really interesting move. And the, the, the point is, like, if you play e5, you surrender d5. So if you give black control of the d5 square, black is positionally almost just winning. Because these knights are so strong. This is so strong. At some point, black might even start rolling the second g pawn at you, and that's very bad. So Gary has to be a little careful here, and he plays this interesting move, bishop f4. Queen d7, rook e1, and he's just trying to free up the e-file and target the weaknesses over here that he thinks that the machine has created. Bishop f3, machine trades off a few pieces. Again, we're having a titanic struggle over this e-pawn. If e f5, the, the d5 square is once again won by black. So f4, that's a big commitment. And probably just a mistake. Probably the machine should just sit here and just wait. 
it should not go f4 because again it's all about this pawn and by going f4 this pawn survives and 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 again that's we see this problem of, of the machines in 1985 they they sometimes will make a move but not realize that five moves down the line the position is going to be terrible it's really not going to like it, the situation now gary plays g4 and this is where the tide of the game began turning uh rook d8 rook d2 e5 d5 gary began locking the center and was going to slowly improve his position. H4, G5, Bishop G4. Create something on that side of the board while these knights are just not really doing a whole lot. H6 played. Gary plays Rook D1. C5, Queen D5. I mean, the position looks absolutely beautiful for white. Um, it's just all about kind of breaking through, right? So the machine has just played the move Queen D7. And um, actually, this position was inspired by a clip I saw. Uh, there was a clip posted actually Kasparov analyzed this exact position um, for you know he has some upcoming project he's doing some sort of master class and you know they took like an excerpt and I saw this clip and he said that he was playing the simul and that clip actually inspired this entire video you know I'm not a guy that's gonna sit here and pretend like oh my god I just like no I so everything from this point forward is me kind of paraphr paraphrasing uh, Kasparov's analysis so at this point Kasparov was like you know the, the, the machine is targeting the queen side, but the human should play where they're stronger. A move like g5 here is really strong. Why? Because if you take on a4, um, the attack over here is much faster. So the queen side is secure, and there's nothing black can do. Like, for example, gh6 here, bring your king, rotate everything over to the king side, blast through. Also, pawn supported by, by two rooks. I mean, wh white is winning, right? g5. But Gary was like, eh, it's attacking my pawn. I'm going to go b3. It can't do anything. And then the tide totally shifted because the machine played c4, which is a very counterintuitive machine move. It looks like kind of a sacrifice of material because knight takes a4 still leads to the same stuff, the same breakthrough. But the machine finds this move, a patient waiting move, not taking a4, but taking on c4. Machines were not always good at this. And now the same idea of g5 simply does not work because the counterplay is fast enough. But even though it doesn't work, Gary has no choice. He has to play g5. If he begins to shift his attention over here, there's a chance the machine just breaks through. So Gary goes for g5 anyway. Knight takes c4, and here Kasparov pulls the ultimate savage bluff. The ultimate bluff. Black's, Black's position is actually already better. Stockfish already saying rookie two, tactics knight e3, then like, but. Gary plays rook to a2. That is a fascinating move. If you plug this into an engine, it says white is a psycho. White is completely lost. And Kasparov knew this. He knew <coughs> that after knight a2, knight a2, the engine was going to go over here. And Gary's chance was going to arise with, sat with taking and coming over here with his remaining pieces. And he assumed that some steps down the line, the engine would not defend precisely against the king side attack. Modern day Stockfish says, Queen A4, boy, it's minus five. But the engine has to be precise, right? And here, the engine says to take this pawn. It does not say to take this knight. It says rook f6, king h7, or taking on h6. It does not say take this and be up five points of material because that actually gives white a little bit of coming back into the game. But Gary knew that the computer would take that knight. So he played queen g2, rook c7, d6. And now we see a queen isolated from the rest of the board. A knight that doesn't really have a way back. Because it's not going to sacrifice itself. That doesn't make any sense. Although it could, but it's not going to. Rook d7. Right? Now Kasparov is activating all the remaining pieces that he has. He plays the move bishop g4, and he targets the rook. Now, black has one move in this position. It's queen a4. It defends the rook, but more importantly, it doesn't allow this bishop to move, right? Like, for example, bishop e6, king h7, and if the bishop ever moves, the rook will hang in a lot of variations. But, the, but it also defends the rook on d7. Um, there's also knight e3, which is a really funny move. And you can trade queens and get to some sort of endgame. The machine plays this move with the same intended purpose, right? But it misses the fact that even though the rook can be given up, after king h2, the queen is stranded. So you see, queen a4, bishop takes d7. This is the point. 
that you actually come back, you don't need to get the rook, and everything is protected, there's no mate. But because queen b3, it thought that, oh, I was just getting a rook too. It doesn't realize it can't stop the attack anymore. Rook f7, bishop e6, uh-oh, queen takes g7 is mate. Because you're pinned. So now you have to run, but now the h-pawn gets through. Knight d6, king e7, and Kasparov emerges with two queens versus queen and knight, and rather than continuing, the turbo star team resigns. So Gary tricked the engine after making a slight inaccuracy and not making the quick break through g5, rather playing the move b3. The engine clever enough to find b3 and rook c8, but then fall back on temptation. Rook a2, and Kasparov just invests all the pieces over there to go for this attack. Nowadays, the allure is kind of killed. You say, oh, Stockfish says this is terrible. Ah, Kasparov, what are you doing? But back then, that didn't exist. Back then, all you know is you've invested the whole queen side into a devastating attack on the king side, right? So in many ways, chess back then was a little bit more interesting because you could just get away with stuff like this. And it was fascinating, the conceptual nature of it. Nowadays, you plug it into any engine, you sit there and go, oh, well, I'm 600, but even I wouldn't have done all that. And we all lie to ourselves. So that's the way Kasparov defeated 32 engines in the year uh, 1985. He also played uh, 10 blindfolded games at the same time that year. He played matches against some of the best players in the world, and he won the world championship later in 1985. So it was a big year for Gary. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you made it this far, I appreciate you very much. Um, and uh, let me know what other content you want uh, to see in the future. Peace out. Get out of here.